Here we are, Real Recovery Talk. I am your host, Tom Conrad. In today's episode, we've got Benjamin B. What's happening, everyone? That was good, Ben. Thanks, dude. And we have Dr. T. What's going on, guys? Benjamin B. and Dr. T. I feel like we're going legit today. (laughs) Yeah. We are. We're legit. That's right. First things first, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in on the podcast app, whichever one that you choose to use, and thank you for watching on YouTube. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you could always reach us, Tom, at Real... I did it again, Ben. That's okay. Just correct yourself, Tom. We all make mistakes. Info, principles. info at RealRecoveryTalk.com. Again, it's info at RealRecoveryTalk.com. You know, I've been, I, I've, I was saying Tom at RealRecoveryTalk.com for so many years. And now just to switch it, it's, it's a learning curve. So anyways, and we want to help you turn your mess into your message, right, Ben? That is correct. Do you still miss my mess to message? I was just sign? looking at that. Now we got like a water buffalo. Yeah. That's got a bad haircut. How did that come about, Tom? Just, I decided that I saw it at Target, and I thought it would match the wall. It matches. You know what I learned (laughs) about? I'll give you that. Do you know what I learned about water buffalo? What's that? Or buffalo in general? Well, they're two different things. What do you mean? There's the buffalo of the Great Plains, and then there's water buffalo like in Vietnam. All right, I don't know about all that. Just whatever. So clearly he knows nothing I mean, about come Buffalo. come on, he's from Minnesota. He knows these things. Well, he's from South Florida. He just had a little bit of a... Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry. I stand corrected. A buffalo. I don't know what kind of buffalo, just a buffalo in general. Like a bison? They run into storms. Do you know why they do that, Ben? I do not. Because if they run into a storm, they can get through the other side quicker. Is your mind blown or what? I mean, is that not recovery related? So next time you make fun of my water buffalo, (laughs) think of what a buffalo does. It runs into a storm head first. I feel like that's what we do at Rock. Yeah, so we can get to the other side. That makes sense. Yeah. See what you did there. What do you think there, T? I love that. Yeah? (laughs) I do. Yeah, it's good. I've heard that before, but I've never thought of that analogy. So I think that's... That's awesome. Yeah. I don't thought. know if it's true or not, but <laughs> Yeah, I I think they just lay down. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. to go by. But, no, right. but I think it it is a saying because Rich Froning, the CrossFit yeah, champion, yeah, yeah. has Buffalo and he has all of these shirts that say like into the storm. So I never put two and two together. He has legit Buffalo? He does. He like yeah, started a, a Doesn't he live in Texas or something? Uh Tennessee. Tennessee. Yeah. Oh, Rich Frowning. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Well, let's get on track here, Ben. Yes, let's do that. So as you can see, we have somebody here, Dr. Pamela Tambini. That is me. Also goes by just Dr. T, I think is the best way to go yeah. right, with this. I like it. Um, we wanted to have Dr. T on because I think it must have been maybe two weeks ago now, Ben that we talked about having a doctor coming on the podcast more regularly. And when I say more regularly, probably a lot more regularly, once Mm -hmm. a week at minimum. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason that we decided to do this, one, because there's a lot of credibility that comes with Dr. Tambini and her knowledge uh, when it comes to addiction. So I'll do a brief introduction. Okay. And if I butcher it in any capacity, you can always come on the other side and fix it up. But Dr. Tambini, I've known for, gosh, how long has it been now? Seven years? Yeah, probably. Going on eight, probably. So Dr. Tambini is, in fact, our medical director here at Rock Recovery Center, and you are board certified in internal medicine. Correct. And also an addictionologist. Correct. Now, what is an addictionologist? Okay. An addictionologist is someone who is board certified in addiction medicine. Um, There was a couple pathways to go through for it. Uh, One was uh, a test in pathway where you use your experience and the amount of time that you've had in treating patients in this realm. 
and you had to have a certain amount of practice hours in order to apply to sit for the board. That was my route because when I originally started, I had the internal medicine board uh, that allowed me to practice in this field. As I became more knowledgeable and had more experience with the patients, obviously I want to practice evidence-based medicine. And I thought that the best route for me would be to go head first into studying for my boards in order to get that board certification uh, in addiction medicine. Now, I think it's within the next year, there's no more experience-based uh, test in per se, and you have to start taking a, a fellowship. So most physicians, they'll go through residency, whether it's internal medicine or psychiatry, and they'll complete that within internal medicine's three years. And then you have to apply to do a fellowship in addiction medicine, which is an additional uh, two more years of training in that field all day, every day for two years. Once you complete the fellowship, then you can have eligibility to sit for the boards in order to get that board certification. That, Go ahead. I, I like it. It sounds like it's going in a good direction because correct me if I'm wrong from what I've picked up on. I've We've been working in the field, Tom and I, for 11 years now. And per licensing standards, like in the state of Florida, a lot of centers, in my opinion, are just kind of checking a box, like just to call it what it is, to mm -hmm. get your license from Department of Children and Families th and get your credentials through Joint Commission. You just have to have an MD, a psychiatrist. I don't or know the DO, exact. Because yep. there's, there's MD, DO. And I've seen, just to like not cut you off, mm -hmm. sorry, but piggyback okay. off of that, they don't necessarily check the subspecialty of the physician. Like I've seen surgeons uh, on, you know, DCF applications running quote unquote treatment centers. I've seen pediatricians who are predominantly trained to treat children, not adults. I've seen that too. Um, I've wow. seen, yeah. So I've seen a lot of different things. Veterinarians, <laughs> and <laughs> possibly. <laughs> I, I want to give a, a real example, for instance, and you know, this is why it's so important to look at the 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 clinical capacity and abilities, the credentials of a facility. Because, for instance, I worked for a facility that had a pediatrician who had been actually worked in the field for a couple of years. But I had a client that I was familiar with, had a good rapport with, and we had to bring this doctor on as a replacement for another one that had retired. And this gentleman literally walked in, and the lady said said to the, the client, what is it that you generally get? I'll just go ahead and write that. And like, wow. and basically, hey, you've been in treatment enough times. This, this person had been in treatment, I believe, about four or five times at this point was familiar with like the general medications mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. get prescribed for anxiety, non-narcotic stuff, obviously, but just really like was so careless mm -hmm. about the way they w went about it. Like, and this client came to me af afterwards and I literally walked right in and said, you're, you know, I had to fire this lady, right. which immediately, right. which, it, you know, is concerning and, and uh, see that this is going in the direction of there's more, I don't know what's what's the word I'm looking for. Checks and balances. Checks and balances for the addiction field in particular, I think, is a really good thing. Right. I mean, it's an emerging field. Um, I'll give them that. You know, I think the the medical society, like as a society, is years behind the treatment world per se. Right. Like our treatment centers, the staff, like you guys who've worked in treatment probably have a lot more common knowledge, like you just said, experiences mm -hmm. like that, than do physicians. You know, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this with you guys is to shed light on that because there's so much stigma in the medical field with physicians working in this field even that I want to break those barriers. But I want to educate people and I want to educate physicians you know, family members, loved ones, even the clients themselves as to, you know, what should you be looking for in a good provider, a good facility, and what do they offer? I think it's important to mention, too, for instance, 
like you're saying, I'll just call it what it is. The clientele that we work with is a very difficult group of people to work with. People in early recovery are ornery. They're manipulative. (laughs) Sure. At times can be disrespectful. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I love in working with Dr. T is she'll come to us immediately and give her her give us her feedback on a client and say, oh, this client tried to manipulate me and X, Y, Z. They're trying to dictate their treatment. And I had to remind them that I'm the professional here. I'm the one prescribing. And you pick up on that stuff and you have that insight through through practice Mm -hmm. and your time in the field like because like i was saying you know our 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 clients they're very savvy they are and and i'm sure you can give a lot of examples of that oh plenty um a lot of their behaviors in their active addiction don't just go away when they enter treatment like that doesn't stop at the door right so when we get patients and that's like why i want to shed light on this field is that I don't take anything personal at all. I come in understanding and knowing that they're going to be honorary, that they're going to exhibit these behaviors and they will manip- try to manipulate you to the T. You know, they'll squeeze whatever they can out mm-hmm. of you. But I have to meet them where they're at. And I think a lot of physicians take offense to how the clients are behaving, which they shouldn't, because that's what got these patients to to where they're at and and why they're here and why they're seeking help. So instead of meeting the patient at their level and where they're at, it's better to take like two steps back and say, listen, I understand what you're trying to do. I understand where you're at and why you're trying to do what you're, you know, what's, what's happening. But I'm here to let you know that we're here to help you to learn and have insight as to why do you do the things that you do and to help guide you or help you pivot your thought process and your behaviors into the right things. Granted, that doesn't happen overnight, but when you meet with patients consistently, weekly, every you know, every two weeks, then monthly and so forth, you see this change. And it's it's awesome to see, but it takes time. And I think a lot of providers don't understand that. With all that being said, let me ask you this. I've never asked you this directly. What got you into working with this population? Like, what happened there? What's the the history behind that? Um, It's a lot of things, actually. You know, one thing is I was that honorary kid. Uh, I can identify with a lot of their behaviors, their thought processes, the things that they do, because, you know, we were all in a certain place at a certain time of our life. So I think I have more street smarts and that that like ability to be personable and, and like just, Hey, let's just talk like normal people. Yes. I went to medical school and I have these degrees, but at the end of the day, you're human. I'm human. Let's just have a conversation. Let's talk about what's going on. Why are you feeling the way you're feeling and how we can take, take baby steps to help that. So that's one aspect. The other aspect was being a child of a father who suffered mental health his, you know, entire adult life. Granted, when I was younger, you don't recognize that. You don't understand why someone's behaving the way they are. Kind of similar to why parent, why don't parents understand why their children are behaving the way they are. And as I got older, you start recognizing things, seeing things, I pill bottles, you know, what's this medicine? Why are you taking this? What's going on here? And then when I got into my early 20s, my dad's like gambling addiction basically took a hold. And the mental health along with the gambling addiction, the behaviors, and then ultimately up until his death, you know, when you're in it, you're not seeing the big picture. You're just in the day to day, that emotional roller coaster with that person. You think, you know, what could I do to help him? Why can't I save him? You know, up until his death, which to this day is questionable. You know, what was it suicide? Was it not? Um, could I have done something differently? What could I that guilt after that person passes away? 
Uh, what could I have done differently? What could I have changed? How could I have behaved? And then coming to that realization years later, you know, working in this field actually helped me. It was like therapeutic for me to understand that it wasn't anything I did. But at this moment, at this time, I can look back and I can help people who are going through the same thing. You know, even though he had a gambling addiction, all of those same behaviors, broken relationships, manipulations, um, all of those things that come along with addiction, you know, I can help people and, and, and be that one person, you know, whoever's life I can make a difference is, is, you know, why I want to do this mm. every day. I didn't know that about your dad. I don't think. Mm. And if you shared that with me before, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for sharing that. I have uh, a question. So going through medical school and all of that stuff, whatever's involved in that, because you're, it's what? So you got four years of undergrad, right? Which you did where? The University of Hawaii. Hawaii. Mm -hmm. That's right. Hawaii. <laughs> um, you do your undergrad and then what, how, how's that go? The. Like the process? Yes. So you do your undergrad. Most, uh, most. People major in their undergrad in a science. So it's like biology, biochemistry, whatever. I majored in psychology just because I, you know, I'm obsessed with human behavior and trying to learn people, understand people. So in addition to the four years, I did an extra year. My I took five years to complete undergrad because I had to do my pre-med requisites. Once you graduate from undergrad, you take your MCATs, which is the admission test into medical school. Then you apply to medical school. You get into medical school. Medical school is four years. Once you complete your medical school, you apply to residency. Well, you're applying like in your third year of medical school. And then you get your residency match where you go do your residency. And depending on what specialty or field you choose determines the length of your residency. So I did internal medicine. So my residency was three years. So that's if I, I was trying to do math. So was that about 12 years? So five, four, three. Yes. 12 years, Ben. <laughs> that's crazy. I mean, that's great, but holy cow. Yeah, that's as long as I've been sober. So what? what's internal <laughs> that's medicine? a long time. <laughs> what's internal medicine mean exactly? Because I don't know. Um, internal medicine is just general, like most people refer to them as generalist. So we focus on the body as a whole from top to bottom. And we basically play quarterback to all the subspecialties. We work closely knit with them, like gastroenterology, cardiology, and we refer patients back and forth and work with our subspecialists in taking care of the patient as a whole. Got it. So you kind of, you're like, you, you know... I'm not going to say a little bit about everything, a lot of bit about everything, but you're not a, uh, like a cardiologist is specific to the heart. They're not. Yeah. So that makes sense. My question was in the 12 years mm -hmm. that you were in school, how much time was devoted towards addiction? Very little, very little. Do you little. have a time like a, to be honest with you. And that's another reason why. I want to do this is to shed light on that. You in in internal medicine specifically, I got zero training on addiction, even in my residency. Now, you do treat patients in addiction, but it's mainly inside the hospital, like when patients come in for detox for certain things, and that's usually the extent of your exposure. Um I was saying, and Dr. Tambini had a little bit of a coughing fit, <laughs> so we had to cut. But <laughs> anyways, we're back now. Um, I, I was saying that that's, it, it's crazy to me that, and I was saying that doctors, obviously, I'm not knocking doctors like we need doctors. It's obviously, you know, very necessary. But I think there is such a huge disconnect with just all of this because, 
on a surface level, a doctor, I come to a doctor, I say, Hey, Dr. Tambini, I'm feeling some sort of way. You know, I got my mind's racing. I just can't seem to shut my mind off. I feel like there's like cinder blocks sitting on my chest at all times. And I just, I'm getting hot. And, you know, if somebody comes to you and says all the, all of those things, generally speaking, your diagnosis is going to be what? Most, I would, again, I don't want to talk for other people, but I would say most internists would say, well, it sounds like you probably have anxiety and you should probably go see a psychiatrist for that. Right. And, and so not then going to want to touch that with a 10 foot pole. Yeah. And then you go to a psychiatrist and then what? And then the psychiatrist will probably try to medicate you with. It depends on the psychiatrist, but I think the, the road we're going down right now is saying, yeah. here's some Xanax, you know, try this out not counseling the patient that this is an addictive medicine, you know, mo it can be diverted. What do these things mean? They'll just say, here's some medicine. It'll make your anxiety better. Come back and see me in a month or two. Yeah. And I had, I had an experience with a, this is in Pennsylvania. When I first experienced anxiety or what I thought was anxiety turned out to be alcohol withdrawal, but I would have never told the doctor that. Um, you know, all the same symptoms and, uh, this doctor never referred me to a psych. They just wrote me a script for Ativan, you know, okay. 0.25 Ativans here, take these nothing about anxiety, you know, number one that we're supposed to have it, Ben, we just did an episode on this not too long ago. Like right. anxiety is there for a reason. Mm -hmm. There's ways to learn to cope with anxiety, so on and so forth. And none of that. It was just, here's your, here's your out of van, take it as prescribed, so on and so forth. And then me, you know, of course I figure out that I can take more to elicit a better result, so on and so forth. And then it ends up, I'm, a, I'm massively addicted to it to the point of taking multiple Xanax per day and no clue. I had no clue the repercussions that could come from that. And I think that that's like, you know, you did 12 years in school. And I mean, it's been a long time since you've been in school, obviously. So maybe things have changed or maybe they haven't. Do you know that answer? I don't think it's changed much, to be honest. Yeah. I, you know, when... When I see patients, this is why I do this, is I like to sit down and say, what is go? What is the context? What is going on? What are our expectations? You know, what has happened before? What's happening now? You spend a little bit more time with the person. You try to understand who they are, where they're coming from. What have they been through in their life that could be triggering these things? And not just reflexively throw medication at them. But unfortunately... <clears throat> the medical field the way it is now with, I'd hate to say it, but insurance reimbursement rates, you have 15 minutes to see patients. They have a panel of 30 patients a day. They don't have the time, nor do they want right. to take the time to to see. So it's easier for them to say, here's a medication, here's a medication, rather than trying to get the full picture and getting the patients you know, what they really need. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I always look at, and this goes for the addiction field as well within the treatment. We talk about it all the time, the structure of the medical field, the structure of, like when we talk on po past podcasts, and I use this example all the time, somebody goes to a detox residential program, I talk to a family and they're like, I don't understand. He did so well for 45 days in this residential program. I said, yeah, he was locked in four walls for 45 days. Right. Then you let him out and he fails. If you look at the hospital, correct me if I'm wrong, but for, as an outsider looking in, it's kind of the same thing. And it's not to say that doctors aren't doing their job because essentially, if I understand correctly, a hospital's job is to stabilize the patient and then get them onto the specialist like you were talking about before. Right. And there ends up being a disconnect between stabilizing them, being able to discharge them from the hospital, and then the outside resources, continuing care, outpatient setting type stuff. And that's really where I feel like the ball gets dropped. 100%. Because Tom and I, we had the opportunity through Dr. T to go down to JFK. We were every other week for how many weeks? Uh, I don't know. Probably like 10 weeks or something. 
we we were going down there and we we had the opportunity to talk to the doctors about addiction and what we do and um it was a different group every time that were within their residency but they were talking about how they constantly see the same p- patients come in over and over an overdose and then they're back the mm-hmm. next day another right. overdose right or if it's an alcoholic they just keep coming back and it's from they discharge them and they've done their job for that setting it's afterwards that I, it's the it's the way it's structured that needs to be looked at i think i agree and we've spoken about i don't know if you remember or not <laughs> but we've spoken about this i've been doing a lot of there's american society of addiction medicine right that's like the governing body and a lot of uh residency programs and the, with the addiction medicine fellowships northeast actually have an inpatient addiction consult service so that when they get a patient like that that comes in like you know that is overdosed or or going through alcohol withdrawal whatever it is they will consult as the primary team the addiction medicine service which usually is comprised of like a physician whether that's the attending physician the residents but social workers maybe you know other ancillary staff that they'll meet meet this patient in patient in the hospital. They'll take them through their stabilization in the hospital, Mm -hmm. but then they will then bridge that gap from the hospital to treatment or next steps. And I agree with you, especially here in South Florida. I don't know of any hospital that has that type of program. And I think that would be something that would be, High, it's a highly necessary in this area, but it would benefit people a lot yeah. more too. But to also go back, when I started in treatment, you know, you're not even taught in residency. I guarantee you, with some of the residents I work now with now, if I ask them, what is PHP? What is IOP? What is OP? What does that mean to you? Wh- what staff works in a setting like that? How often, what's the structure of a program? How often would you as a physician see a patient? I don't think one of them would be able to answer that question. And that just goes to show the lack of education and knowledge, even on the medical side of things. I had to learn all of that on my own once I began practicing Mm -hmm. by myself. Well, when you go through, when you're going through school and you're learning the ins and outs of medications and stuff like that, do they say like when it's, I don't know, you're in the semester learning about benzodiazepines? I know that's probably not how that works, but <laughs> I'm a, you know, let's just say you're, you know, you're in class, you're sitting in front of your teacher and they're talking about benzodiazepines. Did they discuss the, the addictiveness of these medications not at all and those conversations happen usually when you're being taught in medical school they teach you pharmacology that's the word i was looking for pharmacology you're just (laughs) rote memorizing like their mechanism of action how long they work for you know if if someone is there addictive properties yes but what's the physiologic right the of the body how does the body get addicted to it they don't talk about mental addiction they don't talk about there is a little touch on withdrawal from benzodiazepines but that's the extent of the teaching we literally just talked about this with uh joey on what was that two episodes ago remember we were talking about suboxone and Mm -hmm. on the on the suboxone flyer and they taught this when we took a pharmacology of, of drugs of abuse in the addiction program they they were teaching how the medical field doesn't differentiate. There, there's addiction, and then there's dependence. Mm-hmm. And they don't link the two. They're like, oh, if you're physically dependent, you're not necessarily addicted. But in my mind, as an addict, I'm like, is that even possible, really? To I feel like once you've crossed a line into physical dependence, you're probably mentally addicted, too. We have that bias because of the field we work in. Mm-hmm. But I would say I agree with you. You know, going back to Joey, there there's patients you get that are like, I can't do anything without a benzo. I've been sober for 60, 90, 120 days, and I need a benzo. When I leave this program, I am going to get a benzo. And that's that mental 
addiction, that mental need that is just never discussed or addressed. And that like I use that as a teaching opportunity with the patient. You know, I wish you could hear yourself right now. You know, if, if I took you out of the seat that you're in and just had you look from the outside in, you would understand what I'm saying. Um, and that often is not addressed. There's a lot of stuff that isn't addressed when it comes to addiction. Mm -hmm. The mental side of it, the physical side of it, the spiritual side of it. I mean, there's just so much that goes into it, which is why we thought it would be a very, 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 very good thing to bring you on. And um, I want to touch on like she that was like a little mock conversation, you know, role play, if you will, with an imaginary client. But like that's that's what I love about Dr. T's approach. And she was talking about at the beginning of the episode, just being a human being with right. these clients. Like, mm -hmm. how do we 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 talk about it all the time what like when we're dealing with with folks. Recovery has to look cool. Mm -hmm. And I'll just be straight up. I wanted to touch on this. Like she totally fits our culture here at Rock. And for instance, competed in the CrossFit games I, at regionals. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I literally, when parents like ask. <laughs> he, been to, he, he butchered that. Did I? I tried. Whatever. <laughs> but, well, then correct me. What, what is it? I don't know. I'm I not a CrossFit. I did compete at regionals. Okay, I see. But yeah. CrossFit games is completely, you have to, you, oh. you, you share it. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I did regionals. That's when, you know, back when they had regionals. But I did compete in the CrossFit Games three years as a team, huh. not as mm -hmm. an individual. No, you, the way that you <laughs> said it, may, you said she competed at regionals at the CrossFit Games. Regionals and the CrossFit Games are, are separate. Back in the day, you had to get through regionals to be able to get to the Games. Now, Dr. Tambini went to the CrossFit Games on a team. Mm -hmm. mm. So a team of, what, four or five? It was six, six, and then it dropped to four eventually. Yeah. I mean, r needless to say, yeah. badass still. Yeah. Yeah. That's where, <laughs> I, was, Anyways, that's go where ahead, I was going ben. with this. Sorry. But like, because uh, uh, Tom and I, we field a lot of the calls, uh, or all the calls, basically. Right. And we always get questions about, well, what what does the medical side of this look like with your facility in particular? Who's your doctor? Can we look her up? See her sure. credentials? And I always bring up the fact that you fit our culture. One of the things I talk about, and I want your take on this, because, okay. I mean, I feel like I know you well enough where I just kind of say this, but I I believe you're not the type that just says, hey, you're depressed, here's a Prozac. Oh, no. You want to see lifestyle change, mm -hmm. too. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I want to see that they have support, that they're – most people don't advocate for themselves, right? Like, they – they come in from their addiction. They're so beaten down. They're homeless. They're lost. Their family has set their hard boundaries, rightfully so, and they have no support system. And that's really important. Like even the slightest bit of support system, confidence, exercise with structure. I think this program is very big with that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, like a holistic approach to the patient, not just here's a medication, good luck, figure it out. I love that because it's, it's concerning because I've worked in facilities where I've seen that. Like yeah. the doctor comes in and like you said, they spend two minutes with the client. I'll go fill their prescription and that's that. Right. And you just, I know, like for instance, just to give a little insight, like a, after Dr. T meets with our client, she sends us a big email with the synopsis on every single client. And it includes information outside of medical. It's more the, the clinical social aspect, therapeutic, whatever. social. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like what's playing into their symptoms of whatever's going on. Like sleep is a big one too. Insomnia. What else is going on in their life that's driving these things that I don't think a medication is necessarily going to fix this. I think we need to address the fact that they're not exercising. They don't have a schedule. Their schedule is party all night, stay up all night, and then sleep during the day. So then when they come to us, it's hard to switch your sleep cycle back that fast. So it's getting them even just like into a little routine during the day. Like let's not drink coffee after two o'clock. Most patients or people 
will be drinking coffee well into their night meetings, 8 p.m., 9 p.m. And they're like, hey. I just drank a coffee right on this episode, and it's 5 o'clock. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, they're. But I sleep fine. <laughs> so those are the try to. the. Those are the things that I try to uncover as to what's going on with them rather than just saying, hey, try this sleep med tonight. No, if you're not doing the 10 other things that are important for sleep, then that medication is not going to work anyways. Well, and I think it makes sense to like you're somebody that. Again, no, no offense to uh, old people, (laughs) (laughs) people that have been, you know, like you're approachable, you know, the clients, they can sit in front of you, you know, and feel like they're talking to a person and not a doctor, right? you know, and I think that goes a long way because I personally hate doctors. There's only a few doctors (laughs) that I like you, Dr. Stu and Dr. Heather. That's it. Outside of that, I don't want to do, I don't like doctors. But they're like me. They're very approachable. That's why I'm, you know, most people look at physicians and they wear their white coat and they're all professional. But I think sometimes you have to break that stigma. You yeah. have to be down to earth. You have to be approachable. You have to. These patients don't have trust in anything. So if they're, why would they trust me if I walked in with a white coat and me telling them, you're this, you're that, you know, degrading them? That does nothing for them. You have to approach it. As we said, you're a human. I'm a human. We all have our own flaws. We all are coming into this, yeah. you know, scenario from our own side of things. So let's just work together and try to help you through yeah. whatever's going on. Well, I'm excited. I think that uh, you're a good addition to the Real Recovery Talk podcast, right, Ben? There's so much that I want to talk about, but I don't want to save like, it. I don't, exactly, because. <laughs> That oh, I better just shut up. <laughs> yeah, for real. Like that, we're, we're gonna get some really good stuff. I think so too. There's there's a lot of guys. stuff that we could talk about. So for the listeners, for those of you out there that have the questions going on in your mind already, what you can do is you can email us at info at realrecoverytalk dot com, and uh, I think what we'll do at least to start is um. Just answer some questions, Mm -hmm. you know, and then we I mean, between the three of us, we have a huge I mean, I got questions just in my head, you know, probably for 100 episodes that, Mm -hmm. you know, we can come up with. But we want to answer your questions. We don't want to answer our own questions. We already know the answers to those. If that made any sense. (laughs) It makes sense. All right. Any final thoughts, Ben? Yeah, I want to give a shout out real quick to who to Andrew. Obviously, no last names, but uh, there's uh-huh. a guy that listens, <laughs> and man, did this guy come around, but he uh, sent me a screenshot the other day. I guess, what what is it? The pop- Spotify. Spotify t- t- sent him a little thing. Congratulations, you're a top 2% listener. This is how real. disconnected from Ben is from reality. What, what do you mean? <laughs> a- a- in total. No, I know. I know. He's I know. listened to 48 hours straight of our podcast at some point. Like, that's over an entire work week. Worth right? of listening. No, I know. It was just funny how you said the whole thing was Spotify. Oh, I know. I, I'm trying. Because so. Do you know what he's talking about? No. Oh, then you're disconnected, too. <laughs> Anyways. All right, Dr. T, any final thoughts? No, I'm just excited for what the future holds for us. Yes. To educate and break barriers and give knowledge. That's right. Me too. Mm -hmm. All right. That is it for this episode of Real Recovery Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you could always reach us info at realrecoverytalk.com. Again, it's info at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message. That is it. We will see y'all later. Later. Bye.